Um, but also on an international level, um, as we have been concerned by matters domestic, and who could blame us for being so, it's been a hell of a start to the year, hasn't it? It seems that there is something dramatic happening almost every day. And as the Mayor of Hastings also said, my God, was this a week ago? It feels like a month, and it does. That's the, when you think that we are only at the end of February, and what has already occurred for the first two months of this year seems to have, well, almost a decade's worth of news. But the big international story and the massive international story um, has been, has, is obviously the ongoing uh, Ukraine uh, war. I think we're allowed to call it that, aren't we? Uh, tomorrow, from memory, uh, Vladimir Putin is to make a major speech on the eve of Russia invading the Ukraine and their special military operation. Uh, that speech is coming tomorrow, but on the eve of that, uh, President Joe Biden has overnight, our time, uh, visited Kiev in a secret visit and pledged ongoing assistance to um, the Ukrainian government and their fight against the Russians. Um, also overnight, the Japanese have pledged five, over five billion US in financial aid and assistance uh, to the Ukraine. And there seems no let up from European countries um, at all in terms of the aid and assistance they're being provide, although there remains some argy-bargy over what that equipment looks like. Yes, but whilst that is occurring, we have seen at the start of this year tensions between the second uh, most uh, powerful nation on earth, both economically and po possibly militarily as well, I would think so, uh, and that is China and the United States too. It's almost as if we've gone back, wow, it's almost as if we're back in the 1960s or 1970s at the moment, probably the 1970s, I was trying to reach back to a time, maybe 70s, 80s, when international relations were so bad. Um, and joining us to talk about that from the University of Otago is um, uh, Head of Political Studies there, Professor Robert Patman. Uh, good morning to you, Robert. Welcome to the show. Uh, good morning, Michael. How are you? Very well. Um, Professor, uh, the, the thing good. that amazed... I was just trying to work out... I mean, you would have some sort of degree of this as well. I was trying to work out how far back you've got to go back to get this sort of this sort of tension on an international level. And I, I was thinking 70s. Would I be right? Would I? Would I? Or would it be a bit more recent than that? Uh, I think the early eighties was probably, if you like, apart from the Cuban Missile Crisis in the in the early sixties, the second time the Cold War really reached a new low, apart from in the early sixties, and there were numerous lows, of course, during the the Cold War, but was the early eighties, um, and that was a very dangerous period as well. But, you know, I think comparisons with the Cold War, Michael, are dangerous for two reasons. Firstly, the United States and China, um, although they are rivals, they're also very close trade partners. And that's the big difference between um, the geopolitical rivalry in the 21st century between the US and China, who you quite rightly say is the second most powerful country after the United States, and the Cold War period, because during the Cold War period, you didn't mm. really have a, a single global economy. You had mm. one economy led by the Soviet Union, it's had satellites in Eastern Europe, and you had the Western economy. But now we do have a truly global economy, which even communist regimes find themselves participating in. So is it, there's a major structural difference, and I, I keep no, hearing fair enough. that yep. we're being plunged back in, into a new Cold War. I don't think that's the case. Um, having said that, it does appear, certainly from Russia, there is this, uh, was it China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa? There's another country there somewhere, isn't there? India. This sort of, um, yeah. there were five countries that got together before the Ukraine was being invaded um, who were looking to, well, challenge? Um, I don't know if it's the right word. What right word would you use, Professor? Um, the sort of Western style of economic management and order. Would, would I be right? Um, well, yeah. Well, it, uh, I, I'm puzzled by why those countries that you've named, particularly India, have found themselves unable to condemn the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. 
Uh, to me, this is a textbook example of how to break international law, how to rip up the UN rule book about territorial integrity and state sovereignty, which all countries have an interest in protecting. So I'm very surprised about India, democracy remaining neutral uh, it when there's such a blatant violation. There are other countries there you named, South Africa, countries which have had uh, colonial experience and therefore still tend to view the United States through the lens of what it calls U.S. imperialism. But, uh, as I say, I, 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 in, a, in a sense, uh, Mr. Putin does have uh, some friends around the world, uh, Syria and North Korea and China, but, and, and there are a number of other countries unwilling uh, to support Ukraine because they see it as a, really a battle between I think they, they quite. I, I think this is a false perception, by the way. But they see it as a battle between NATO, or the United States and Russia, and that Ukraine is just a, a pawn, which of course is part of Mr. Putin's narrative. But I don't think it's true. Um, well, there is that view um, being expressed in New Zealand as well, amongst some, and you'd be aware of that too, Professor, that this is some sort of jack up oh, yeah. along those lines. Um, and and I guess yeah. you're also finding that narrative in Republican circles um, in the United States as well, where they are clearly reluctant to continue their support of the Ukraine. There are some in the Republican Party who take that view, but they have to sit, they have to take a step back and look in the mirror and say, what does America stand for in the world? Is it about uh, the right to have free elections and democracy? and the ability for people to determine their own future. Because Mr. Putin's attempt to invade, this is not a special military operation, this is a, an invasion and an a, attempted annexation. If that succeeded, uh, that would create the message that the might is right and that authoritarian regimes, if necessary, have the right to rearrange their environment. And does the United States actually want that sort of world? Uh, I don't think so. So well, I, I, I mean, those people in the it's, it's funny you should say that because having studied American history myself, there's always been that strong isolationist yep. group within the United yeah, States. Yeah, I Robert. mean, I think, um, I think, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right, Michael. You put your finger on it. It's not so much, if you like, ideological support for Mr. Putin per se. It's more, it's, it, we have to be careful about how far we get committed in the world. There's that, mm -hmm. there's that isolationist strain, is there? Mm. Um, all right, now, moving on to what we're going on to talk about today, which is this US-China thing, which has just escalated beyond, I mean, the shooting down of the balloon. Mm. They've shut down everything since then and found out that most of it doesn't come from China. Um, the fact they don't know where it comes from, <laughs> um, the, which I find I sort of slightly ironic here. Um, in the last um, 24, 48 hours, the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, um, has uh, warned, publicly warned, which is an interesting thing to do, China from supplying weapons and ammunitions to Russia for the Ukraine war. Um, why mm. did he do that? I think he must have intelligence, the US government must have intelligence, that China is contemplating that step. And um, it, it, it would, I think, be very, it could be very counterproductive um, given the U Chinese dependence on the U.S. market. I mean, you only have to look at recent trade figures. Um, the, so the U.S.-China trade in goods in 2022 reached a new record, and the U.S. exported um, something like 538.5 billion goods. Um, sorry, 300, I'm getting my figures mixed up here. 536.8 billion, a lot of, of, of value there of exports to the United States in goods. And so they, they have to be very careful. And I think the Americans realize that they do have leverage because you see the whole rise to superpower status for China has been based on full-blooded immersion in the world capitalist economy. And so the Americans are warning them the warning the Chinese leadership, now look, if you provide arms to the Putin regime, which has 
violated all the norms of international relations, including, including state sovereignty, you run the risk of walk, you know, walking into sanctions from us. And that could have quite severe economic consequences. So I think Blinken is serious when he says this. The Americans also, of course, there's been an edge to the American comments because they've been infuriated by what appears to be uh, quite a substantial spy balloon uh, program or surveillance, uh, balloon surveillance program that the Chinese have been conducting. Of course, as we've heard in the last 24 hours, another large balloon has been detected near Hawaii, although well, it's gone a bit quiet in the last 10 hours, but there were certainly reports last night about that. Um, well, I guess the other thing that appears to me is that the, those of us for who are in sort of isles like New Zealand sort of are a bit bemused by this because we know that the major powers crisscross each other with satellites all the time seeking information. Mm. Is, is the fact that there's a balloon that's flying across the United States just make it more overt because we know there are covert operations as we speak um i think countries tend to make a, a distinction between their airspace and what might be described as outer space uh sure the superpowers and uh here we can say that russia is a great power because although if you look at us china and, and russia and countries like this increasingly india they have sophisticated uh, space networks of satellites which can uh, you know have cr incredible powers of surveillance and as you say then this goes on all the time so they are looking at each other and what each other are up to rep on a regular basis but it does seem to be that countries jealously get, got, um, guard their airspace and I think that was part of the um, response of the Americans to China there's also another, there's a political angle to this, though, Michael, that shouldn't be lost. The Chinese, according to many American analysts, were not just engaged in information gathering through their spy balloons. By the way, their spy balloons are quite good if they are spying, and the Chinese deny that. But the, these surveillance balloons, let's call them that, are good at uh, evading radar. We know that this program has been going on for some time, but Mm. The most recent episode when the Americans shot down a spy balloon, the Americans only saw it initially through a visual, through visual means. And it wasn't picked up on radar. So uh, that may be, uh, but the, the Americans believe that these balloons are not just designed to, to get information around sensitive military sites. They also believe they're designed to test America's military reflexes. How ready is America to respond to some sort of intrusion? And that's why I think the Americans are being very firm and very robust because they realize that China sees America as its long-term rival that it must displace as the world's number one and that it's testing America, it's not just looking to get information about America, but testing its willingness to use the power that it undoubtedly has. Um, now, China is our major trading partner, Robert. We've got, what, over 30%, yeah. I think, of our exports go there. It is number one, and sure. it's number one by quite some distance. I think Australia is number two. Um, but yeah, yeah. We're, we, 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 we have to be very careful, don't we, that we don't antagonise a, a country that mm -hmm. is actually quite sensitive, despite its size, to criticism. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one party states are notoriously thin skinned. They don't teler tolerate dissent at home and they don't like criticism from overseas. Um, and yes, we are engaged in a bit of a balancing act, but so are about 20 other countries whose number one trade partner is China. And one of mm. the, those countries is Australia. Uh, so we're not alone in that balancing act. Um, the, the, the crucial thing, however, as I think governments in recent years have in New Zealand have acknowledged, is that New Zealand, as a matter of strategic urgency, must reduce its trade dependence on China by diversifying. There was there has certainly there are hopes that the relationship with Japan, the third largest economy in the world, can be significantly increased in the not too distant future. 
and um, Nanaya Mahuta was recently in India. So I, I think there, I think New Zealand's concern is in the long term to reduce that trade dependence, which you very accurately depicted on the Chinese, because it does have political implications. China tends to in view economic dependence of the nature that we now have or trade reliance as some commentators call it as a way as a leverage on country which has that trade reliance so uh, yeah we 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 certainly have um if you like we we mustn't have too many uh, eggs in one trade basket we've got to keep uh, diversifying um this year, looking further ahead, do you expect? Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to make you know make you look in a crystal ball. You know, put all your years of vast <laughs> experience and academic knowledge um, to the test. Here we go, Robert. Um, all right. By the end of the year, has China supplied weapons and ammunition to Russia? Possibly Ooh, on a covert basis. You're taking too long to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, long to answer. Uh, yeah, but, but it is a difficult question. Um, I know. I, I think Chinese will be... Uh, let me answer it succinctly. I think, Michael, the, the Chinese response will be cautious because they realise they're the biggest beneficiary from the world economy in the last four decades. They'll be very careful to do anything that would jeopardise that. The Americans are just reminding them they may try to get round that by pretending they're not giving arms to Russia when they are. We'll just have to wait and see. It's a very interesting situation that's developed. I don't think China's going to, um, uh, you know, how should I put it, uh, risk its national interest for the sake of Mr. Putin's regime in Moscow, which has engaged in a catastrophic and illegal invasion of a neighbour. That's my view. Okay. And finally, um, I get the sense, and I mean, I'm looking from afar. I'm in New Zealand. I'm not an academic. I'm not an expert. But when I look at the Ukraine, I get a sense that this is intractable, that no one's going to win this war. The Ukrainians aren't going to push out the Russians because they don't have that sophisticated weaponry to do so. The Russians are not going to be able to advance too much further into the Ukraine because, well, frankly, the West won't let them. Um, you get the feeling that this is the First World War in some senses of a static place of a conflict that could last for years. Um, that's my perspective from here. What's yours? No, I see it differently. I see this year going into two phases. Remember, in the last quarter of last year, the Ukrainians made spectacular counter-offensive advances in, in places like Kherson, Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine. Uh, I think this year the much vaunted, much heralded Russian offensive has already begun, but it's largely infantry-led, and it means that Russia is taking appalling casualties up to a 1,000 troops in some cases a day. They are depleted in terms of tanks. They've lost more than 3,000 tanks, and they've lost even more um, about 3,500 armoured personnel vehicles during their attempt to invade and annex Ukraine. So I think um, the Ukrainians will be on the defensive for the first part of the year, but I do think there's a counter-offensive being planned. And by the way, the Ukrainians are beginning to get really sophisticated weaponry from uh, the United States and Western countries. The Leopard 2 tanks will be coming on stream Leopard 1 is, uh, tank is already being delivered. Uh, but the Leopard 2 tanks are probably the best tank uh, of its kind in the world for the sort of environment that Ukraine is, a, you know, a large, flat country. It's got mobility and speed and power, and the Russians are extremely upset. But the Ukrainians will shortly have that. So, uh, And the, the cost of this war, even for a, uh, an authoritarian regime, um, are substantial. And it's costing Russia more than around about 800 million US dollars a day. This is an economy which is about the size of Italy's. So how long can this go on? I, I think a decisive turning point will be reached by the middle of the, the year. Uh, the Ukraine's done much better than many people 
felt, and I don't think you can rule out um, uh, severe military reversals for Mr. Putin in, in the second half of the year. So I, I think there will be. Um, I don't think the war is intractable. I think it's going through phases, and um, in a sense, you know, if you want to use a boxing analogy, um, the heavyweight is throwing the punches now. Uh, with, with not too much accuracy, but throwing them. And their middleweight, which is the Ukraine, is trying to absorb and evade many of those punches uh, it, it, to try to pick the moment when they can deliver a pretty decisive counteroffensive. All right. Okay, well, I guess the proof will be in the pudding, won't it? Um, but nevertheless, thank you so be. much for your insight. Yeah, uh, and thank you for your insight, thank you. Professor Petman. I really really enjoy all your conversations all the time. You have a good day. Um, okay, that thanks, is Mike. Professor Robert Patman. Okay, thank you. From University of Otago. He always gives some sort of erudite overview of what's happening in the international world. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what you think as well. Uh, how do you see that conflict going? And the reason why it's important to New Zealand is, well, become even more clear now. We're going to have to borrow $13 billion on the international market are going to have to worry about international economic conditions. The Ukraine and that particular conflict is, well, so much apart, uh, related to inflation, related to shortage of supplies, related to, well, the whole geopolitical context in which we are a trading nation. Your thoughts?